Is it water with the sheep in the in the box? The story of King Arthur is one of those that seemingly everyone knows, but also very few people outside of specific academics knows a whole lot about. Who was Arthur? Was he a real person? Why is his story so weird and confusing? Was he a Christian king ordained by God who sent him off in search of the Holy Grail? Or was he a pagan warrior king who consorted with water spirits and had a best friend who was a wizard? Was he given his sword Excalibur by a woman who lived in a lake, or did he draw it from a stone? We tend to get swept up in the romance, fantasy, and thrill of the legend, and quite understandably. It's iconic and has lasted for a thousand years for a reason, and it's not going away anytime soon. Personally, I love these old stories. There's something comforting and honestly enrapturing about them, and there's nothing quite like an Arthurian movie, TV show, or book based on these legends, from Merlin to Game of Thrones to Camelot, or indeed the Monty Python version of the legend. Well, in this video we're going to be a little less intense and political than the previous one where I talked about the politics of Robin Hood, so kick back, put your feet up in front of the roaring fire, pour yourself a nice cup of cocoa and come with me as I explore the politics, yes, but primarily history of the Arthurian legends and delve into life in Iron Age and medieval Britain in search of the once and future king, as well as his Celtic origins and spirituality. Maybe on the way we'll even stumble across an errant pixie or magical sword. Come with me then, as I begin with possibly the most difficult and fundamental question of all. Alright, so before we really get into the logistics of this, the truth of how Arthur would have lived, how accurate our ideas about him are, and so on, first we must ask a simple question. Was Arthur even a real person, and if so, who was he? There's no definitive answer to this question, sadly, as if he did exist, he would have lived some time around the 5th or 6th century AD, and very little written record from that time survived due to a combination of literacy rates, no printed works, and so on. It's called the Dark Ages for a reason after all. There's actually been significant debates over whether or not the early histories that mention him are accurate at all, are a complete fabrication, or just misunderstanding the truth of the matter. Though nowadays most scholars do agree that these stories are a blend of history and myth. Most historical records do seem to corroborate the idea of a great leader of the Britons opposing and defeating the Saxons in battle, though whether or not this can be accurately attributed to someone named Arthur is up for debate. However, most historians do agree that a figure who played the role filled by Arthur in our minds almost certainly did exist, but the contention is a matter of ascertaining whether or not he was called Arthur, and if that even matters. However, despite this, there are some who argue that there is no proof for the existence of Arthur at all. One archaeologist did actually say of the matter, no figure on the borderline of history and mythology has wasted more of the historian's time. Sadly, there is evidence to suggest that this may be accurate. Gildas's 6th century polemic De Exido et Conquestu Britanniae, or On the Ruin and Conquest of Britain, written within living memory of Badon, the battle at which Arthur supposedly smashed the Saxons' invasion of Britain, mentions the battle but does not mention Arthur. Arthur's not mentioned in the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle or named in any surviving manuscript written between 400 and 820. He is absent from Bede's 8th century ecclesiastical history of the English people, another major early source for post-Roman history that mentions Badon. The historian David Dunville wrote, I think we can dispose of him quite briefly. He owes his place in our history books to a no smoke without fire school of thought. The fact of the matter is that there is no historical evidence about Arthur. We must reject him from our histories and, above all, from the titles of our books. Indeed, some scholars argue that Arthur was originally a fictional hero of folklore, or even a half-forgotten Celtic deity, who became credited with real deeds in the distant past, as the tales of great heroes, both real and fictional, began to merge. They cite parallels with figures such as the Kentish Hengist and Horsa, who may be gods that later became historicised. It's not even certain that Arthur was considered a king in the early texts, perhaps merely being a famous and well-regarded warrior. Neither the Historia nor the Annales calls him Vex, the former calls him instead Dux Balorum, or leader of war and Miles, or soldier. The consensus among historians today is that it's not impossible that he existed, but there's no solid evidence for his historical existence, and so it would be inaccurate to say that he was definitely a real person. However, because historical documents for the post-Roman period are scarce, it is possible that
all the historical records confirming his existence simply didn't survive. Either way, it's clear as things stand right now that a definitive answer to the question of Arthur's historical existence is unlikely to ever be answered unless we get around to inventing time travel, I guess, in which case we can just go ask him and not be understood because we don't speak the same language he would have. Sites and places have been identified as Arthurian since the 12th century, but modern archaeology can only confidently, reliably reveal names through inscriptions found in secure, observed contexts, and even then the validity is sketchy at best. Examples of this include the so-called Arthur's Stone, discovered in 1998 among the ruins of Tintagel Castle in Cornwall in securely dated 6th century context, which created a brief stir but proved ultimately irrelevant in furthering Arthurian study. Other inscriptional evidence for Arthur, including the Glastonbury Cross, is likely purely bullshit, considering that, well, Arthur, if he existed, would not have been a Christian, and the monks who discovered it were struggling financially at the time, and a discovery of religious significance like King Arthur's tomb would have brought in desperately needed funds. Nowadays, we've been able to say pretty conclusively that it was likely a hoax, sadly. However, ignoring this whole discussion of Arthur the man for now, it's clear that the ideas we often have about Arthur are very wrong just on the face of it. If he lived in the 6th century, he wasn't going to look and act like a 16th or 17th century knight, as he's often portrayed. He would have been a warlord, violent, brutal, dirty, and perhaps somewhat reflective of this period, known as the Dark Ages. Regardless, whether as a singular man, a group of people, or someone carrying out his role but under a different name, someone did, according to historical documents we have and can probably trust to an extent, stop the Anglo-Saxon invasion in its tracks, so after a certain point, one just has to wonder what counts as being a real person anymore. He didn't have a magical sword either, I imagine. But if all of this is true, then why do we have all these ideas and centuries of poetry, literature, legend, and even modern versions of the tale of a supposedly historical figure who likely didn't exist, or if he did, was more of a local warlord or leader of a roaming band of mercenaries? Who came up with all this stuff about wizards and magic swords? Did some guy just make it all up or something? As a fan of fun legends and the story of King Arthur in general, bless Geoffrey of Monmouth. But equally, as a fan of history and accurate historical record, fuck Geoffrey of Monmouth. Alright, so this guy has a bit of a complicated legacy, so let's get some context first. When it comes down to it, the conflict and the many strange contradictions at the heart of the story of King Arthur can be summarised as a clash of cultures, beliefs, and traditions. As we'll go into later on in this video, the legend is primarily a pagan Celtic one, and would have been well known and familiar to people at the time, primarily through oral storytelling and myth, but to a greater or lesser extent, it was attempted to be co-opted and absorbed into the newer, more recognisable traditions and belief systems of Anglo-Saxon Christianity, which at the time Arthur was alive, and where these myths and legends originated, was mirrored by the cultural and in many ways violent military struggle between the indigenous Celtic people, known as the Britons, and the invading Anglo-Saxons, who sought to gain supremacy over Britain after the departure of the Romans left somewhat of a power vacuum. But how to convince the native people to follow the new Christian belief system. Such a monumental task couldn't be done with force alone, with the limited resources of a dark age or even medieval people, and the two belief systems had coexisted to a greater or lesser extent for hundreds of years without the church wiping the pagan traditions out completely, so a new method was required. Assimilation. Sure, the Britons could keep many of their traditions and their aesthetics, but as a compromise, they would need to believe in the Christian God and the altered versions of these traditions. This is how the ancient legend Legends of fairies, pixies, and other nature spirits of Old Britain became manifestations of demons under the influence of the Christian devil, magic became miracles, wizards became saints, and of course, ancient Celtic warlords became Christian kings ordained by God. This actually wasn't always deliberate, of course. For your average Anglo-Saxon or Norman later in history, looking back, it would just make sense that those primitive tribes people would see miraculous acts of God working through man and attribute them to magic because they didn't understand them with their tiny brains. This conflict and slow assimilation took place over centuries, and was largely, though not entirely, successful, being effective but only up to a point. Anyway, into this scenario bumbles Geoffrey of Monmouth, a young historian, cleric, and bullshitter who in 1136 AD wrote his most famous, some would say infamous, work, Historia Regum Britanniae, or The History of the Kings of Britain, originally called De Gestis Britonum, or On the Deeds of the Britons. A supposedly historical record, though nowadays is widely 
regarded as a pseudo-historical nonsense fanfiction, very slightly supported and legitimised by the inclusion of a couple of names from old historical tomes, but likely fabricated from Geoffrey's own imagination. It chronicles the lives of the kings of the Britons over the course of 2000 years, beginning with the bold claim that the Trojans founded Britain in ancient times and continuing until the Anglo-Saxons assumed control of much of Britain around the 7th century. Although taken as historical well into the 16th century, it is now considered to have no value as accurate historical research or record as when certain events described, such as Julius Caesar's invasions of Britain, can be corroborated from contemporary histories, Geoffrey's account can be seen to be demonstrably, wildly inaccurate. It remains, however, a valuable piece of medieval literature which contains the earliest known versions of the story of King Lear and his three daughters, and for our purposes today, helped repopularise the legend of King Arthur, which had fallen into obscurity and was generally not a tale that gripped the imaginations of the Anglo-Saxons at the time, which of course is why we're talking about it here. Geoffrey's brief description of Arthur's tale, which as mentioned in reality would have taken place sometime in the 5th or 6th century, is both familiar and alien to anyone who knows the legend nowadays. Arthur is conceived as a result of magical shenanigans, becomes king after the death of his father, Uther, and defeats the Saxons so severely that they cease to be a threat until after his death. Following this victory, Arthur goes on to conquer most of Northern Europe in a sort of inverse Roman Empire of sorts and ushers in a period of peace and prosperity that lasts until the Romans, led by Lucius Hiberius, demand that Britain once again pay tribute to Rome. Arthur defeats Lucius in Gaul and apparently set his sights on becoming Emperor of Rome, but in his absence his nephew Mordred seduces and marries Queen Guinevere and seizes the throne, forcing him to return to Britain. When Arthur returns, he defeats and kills Mordred at the Battle of Camlan, sometimes this is also referred to as the Battle of Badon. It seems Arthur likely had two major military victories, one of which he died in, but history muddles them up quite a bit, so it may be either one battle misremembered as two or any number of things. But mortally wounded, he's carried off to the Isle of Avalon and hands the kingdom to his cousin Constantine, son of Cador and Duke of Cornwall. Merlin plays a really honestly huge part in this version of history, sticking around for hundreds of years and, would you believe it, makes a number of shockingly accurate predictions about things that happened in the 12th century that he would have had no way of knowing about, but someone like Geoffrey of Monmouth definitely would have. Honestly, as soon as you realise this, it's impossible to enjoy any documentaries or YouTube videos about the legend because they all just seem to take Geoffrey's version of events as purely reliably historically accurate and it starts to get rather grating. This may seem like a weird place to start, but it's important to note the context and origins of the legend of King Arthur, and the first place to start is how our current mythologised version of the story began, before investigating both what came after, as the tale caught on and was embellished by storytellers and oral tradition, as well as going back to investigate what the real Arthur, who in my opinion was likely a real person, might have been like and how he might have lived. Let's start with the history. King Arthur probably falls under the category of mytho-historical figure, in that whilst he likely was a real person, a real king in fact, most of what's commonly attributed to him is not historically accurate and has been embellished and changed over the centuries. So who was the historical King Arthur? Well, it's likely, based on the historical texts that survived from the time, that the man known as Arthur was a Welsh warrior who, in the mid-6th century, led a resistance to the West Saxon invasion of traditional Celtic lands. This is primarily based on a conflation of two early early writers, the religious polemicist Gildas and the historian Nennius, and on the Annales Cumbriae of the late 10th century. The 9th century Historia Britonum, traditionally attributed to Nennius, records 12 battles fought by a warrior king known as Arthur against the Saxons, culminating in a victory at a place recorded as Mons Badonicus, or the Battle of Badon. The modern location of which is disputed, but likely the south of England in what was at one time the Kingdom of Wessex. However, Geoffrey of Monmouth, the absolute buffoon, claimed, based on literally zero evidence other than his own imagination, that Badon was the modern city of Bath, and included a very real instance of Merlin foretelling that Badon's famous Roman baths would lose their hot water and turn poisonous prior to the battle, so make of that what you will. Anyway, the point here is that Arthur, if he existed at all, was likely an Iron Age warrior king. Definitely wasn't English, though even if he had been born in what is now England, he still wouldn't be an Englishman because England didn't exist for another 400 years after Arthur died. In fact, he primarily 
existed in opposition to the Saxon forces that went on to form England, the country he's supposedly the once and future king of. Let's go over a few historical misconceptions, shall we? First, let's talk about the legendary Camelot. Great castle, and in some cases entire nation, ruled over by King Arthur, on occasions where Arthur doesn't simply found Camelot, it's previously also ruled over by Uther, his father, though this is partially contradicted by the sword in the stone legend, and base from which the Knights of the Round Table operated and lived in between quests. Usually, Camelot is treated as a late medieval castle, towering over the surrounding land, similar, or sometimes even more grand in scale to Warwick Castle, one of the few remaining British fortified castles which, whilst it was built in the early Middle Ages, was demolished, rebuilt and refurbished multiple times throughout the years to keep it competitively defensive, was up to date as an effective fortified defence as late as 1752 and was last under siege in 1642 where the garrison repelled the royalist forces during the English Civil War, the Earl of Warwick at the time being a parliamentarian. Nowadays it's a great tourist attraction but to pretend that such a castle is realistically going to have existed in ancient history is an absolute joke and does immense disservice to the people of the past. Building, updating and maintaining a structure like a castle is an immense undertaking and usually those with the money to do so will be hiring people at the absolute pinnacle of their craft contemporary to the time. Or to put it another way, to claim that such a structure as this could be realistically inhabited by someone like King Arthur is ridiculous unless you're going to claim that there was a secret king somewhere in the late medieval period, a time of which we do have extensive historical records, unlike the Dark Ages, that we've just never heard about for some reason. It's actually very funny to me that half the time the story of King Arthur is portrayed it's at least a thousand years out of date. And don't get me wrong, I get it, obviously medieval stories of knights in shining armour, giant castles and so on, are certainly a lot more cinematic and capture the imagination very quickly. There's a reason Game of Thrones and Lord of the Rings take place in fantasy worlds very closely comparable to late Middle Ages Europe after all. It would be a bit underwhelming if the Battle of Helm's Deep had taken place at a late Bronze or early Iron Age hill fort, right? The same of course is true of Arthurian legend. We imagine this mythical place Camelot where all this grand stuff is happening, giant feasts, weddings, high court drama, great quests and so on, and we think of the sort of place you can take your kids to nowadays for a day out. A giant, impressive castle with miles and miles of sheer stone wall, but the reality is that when Arthur was around, the closest to a castle that would have existed would have been a hill fort. What's one of those then? Well, a hill fort is a kind of fortified structure, typically atop a large hill, in order to exploit a rise in elevation for defensive advantage. The fortification usually follows the contours of the hill and consists of one or more lines of earthworks with wooden stockades or defensive walls and external ditches. Hill forts developed in the late Bronze and early Iron Age and were largely replaced by Roman forts in some areas of the country, but obviously only where the Romans had bothered to build them, i.e. key strategic points throughout what has now come to be known as England and not areas dominated by the unconquered indigenous Celtic peoples like, for example, Wales and Scotland. It's just a bit less impressive to think of Camelot as a bunch of wattle and daub houses on top of a hill with a wooden fence and a couple of ditches encircling it, you know? Likewise, the same could be said of the weapons and armour often portrayed. We'll get into Excalibur later on, but for now let's focus on the classic setup of your Arthurian knight. Full plate armour, good quality steel longsword, and usually a kite shield, though sometimes a round one. How realistic would this setup have been? For the mid to late Middle Ages, probably relatively accurate, though for a horse-mounted warrior some kind of pole arm or something with a longer reach than a longsword would probably have been useful as well, but as we've established, King Arthur likely lived an entire millennium or more before then, and much like the technology surrounding stonemasonry and castle construction, the science and art of metallurgy likewise changed and improved drastically over that very long period. Depending on who you ask, the Celtic people of Wales were arguably living within a late Iron Age, considering that they didn't benefit from much of the Roman remnant technology such as steel in the same way the Saxons and other groups inhabiting ancient England may have done. In fact, it is speculated that Excalibur, rather than being a magical weapon, was simply a strong, effective steel sword, which at the time would have been rare in the region and as such makes sense to have been wielded by a legendary warrior king. Rather than swords, for most warriors of the period, the basic weapon was the spear, which were mostly iron-headed, though if a particularly skilled smith and a high enough quality of material could be sourced, sometimes steel edge. Not that there weren't swords, of course, but they were rare. Indeed, we have found them in fewer than 1 in 10 burials with a weapon, which of course makes sense because they represent a huge investment in materials and labour, so if anything they would ideally be reused, but obviously this means that they were less likely to survive the ravages of time. They were, compared to swords of later periods, not particularly well balanced, much softer and more likely to be made with pattern welding, time consuming and admittedly beautiful decorative technique with no 
directly functional advantages other than maximising the use of the material available. That is to say, they were about status as much or more than they were about killing, though some of the injuries that have turned up in cemeteries do show that they were good at killing too. Swords from this period were usually around 90 centimetres long, had little or no counterbalancing or taper to their blades, and would have swung comparatively slowly, but devastatingly hard. More of a sharp club or baseball bat than a rapier, but the thing about baseball bats is that they do serious damage to another person's skull if swung correctly. Likewise, when it came to shields, they would have been round, small, on average 60 centimetres in diameter, wooden, and had a metal dome in the centre, usually with a knob on the end, perhaps to catch or bind opponent's spears. The metal protected the user's hand, which gripped the shield with an iron handle that was braced with wood and wrapped in leather in the centre. The shield was made from thin wood, covered, usually on front and back, with leather, which stiffened and strengthened the wood. The edge was almost never bound with metal strips, unlike those seen in future use, or even things like, for example, later adaptations and retellings of the great legends of King Arthur. In fact, the primary use of a shield at the time would have been essentially to redirect an opponent's weapon, rather than block any kind of attack outright. Armour is much more difficult to discuss, because it mostly didn't survive if it was used. Evidence for body armour is basically non-existent. There have been occasional finds, but nothing widespread, meaning that in all likelihood it was very rare, or else armour was mostly fur or leather based, which would decompose over the centuries, unlike metal armour. It's also possible that people at this time simply didn't see a need to wear body armour, since at the time, the UK would have been fragmented into small local communities, ruled by local warlords and or powerful warriors, and whilst conflict and battle may have been constant between these groups, it was likely very small scale. Not full scale battles, but intermittent cattle and slave raiding, small skirmishes and violent dick measuring and posturing. As a result, the weapons were suited for this kind of fighting. Light, nimble spears and small shields for the skirmishes that may have dominated the battlefield, and the intention was rarely if ever to actually butcher your opponents, so the need for extensive armour was minimal at best. Think of the Dark Ages as a local very rough sports bar. Fights happen all the time, especially after matches, and there's a lot of rivalry and posturing, but ultimately it's not going to actually result in a full-scale war between Arsenal and Liverpool fans, and nobody shows up wearing a stab vest. But admittedly, sometimes a couple of blokes will have a punch-up outside if one of them perceives the other to have been looking at them funny. Your average contemporary sword would have been of similar or perhaps lower quality than your average kitchen knife, and the sort of highly sophisticated plate armour we see on TV and in movies didn't really come into prominence until the late 15th century and beyond, though individual plates, usually chess pieces, have been around for a while longer. The interconnecting full body sets of plate armour are much more recent development. Sorry, but this is just most likely bullshit. Mitt Romney referred to the ethnic English diaspora using a term that has fit this meaning for centuries, Anglo-Saxon. That's how we've always described ourselves, not just we English people, but the Australians, the Canadians and the Americans. But for some reason, the liberal media in Britain uh, met this comment by Mitt Romney with heavy criticism. They said, <laughs> we're not Anglo-Saxons anymore. We might as well refer to Jews. <laughs> Why do you call us Anglo-Saxons? We don't have anything in common with you in that sense. We're not Anglo-Saxons. All right, so before we move on, we kind of have to talk about and acknowledge the history of Britain as the place everyone loves to invade, because it's more and more important to mention the further back in time you go. I say this because some people, specifically Americans, though some Brits, may not really be aware, but often identitarians, and especially far-right fascist and or ethno-nationalist types, like to lean on some scaremongering bullshit about the erosion of Anglo-Saxon culture or how proud they are of their Anglo-Saxon heritage without knowing or understanding anything about anything they're talking about. And since we're talking about the Saxons here, let's quickly go into the validity of that kind of self-identification, shall we? First, let's discuss where the term comes from. Who were the Anglo-Saxons? What does that term even mean? Well, it's an ethnonym that refers to a disparate group of Germanic tribespeople who, shortly after the Romans abandoned their outposts in what at the time was known as Britannia, noticed and chose to try to fill the power vacuum and invaded and settled the comparatively safer island nation, having been pushed westwards by the Huns in the east and unable to find safe harbour on mainland Europe. These Germanic tribes were made up of many groups, including Goths, Vandals, Angles, Saxons, Lombards, Swibi, Frizzi and Franks, though the two largest groups were the Angles and the Saxons, which is why they came to be known as the Anglo-Saxons. The native people living in Britain at the time,
time, who were known by the Romans and themselves, of course, as the Britons, though there were other groups and tribes also recognised like the Picts, the Scots and other groups besides, collectively known as the Celts. The main reason we know the Anglo-Saxons, of course, is because they named the country of England after themselves, and as a result, the term Anglo-Saxon came to be synonymous with English culture. It is indeed true that during the reign of Alfred the Great, England was first formed as the disparate kingdoms of Northumbria, Wessex, East Anglia and Mercia, among a couple of other constantly changing smaller states, known by historians as the Heptarchy, were united under a single banner for the first time in the 9th century after the threat of the common enemy, that being the Danish invaders at the time attempting to conquer Britain, rallied the leaders of these various kingdoms to action. This was around three to four centuries after Arthur and the Britons had been repelling them as the invaders, and ironically not long before the Norman conquest, wherein the Normans replaced the Anglo-Saxons as the rulers and dominant force in the region. Of course, over this time there was significant cultural blurring of lines, and many Britain and Anglo-Saxon people had interacted and to a certain point amalgamated, just as the Romans had before them. And likewise, the same is true of other invading groups like the Vikings, Normans, and so on. Anyway, I just wanted to put this whole idea of British, or I guess even English culture being synonymous with Anglo-Saxon culture or heritage to rest, because frankly it's bullshit and anyone who says shit like this just doesn't understand a thing about the history of the country they claim to love. The Normans held on to England a lot longer than the Anglo-Saxons did, as did the Romans, and the Britons were doing just fine by themselves before then, so let's not venerate this one group of Germanic tribes above all other groups to have called this cold, wet island their home over the centuries, eh? Or at least learn a little bit about the history of said soggy island before claiming ownership over it for a group of long-dead people, because otherwise, you might end up looking like a bit of a twat. Much of the time, the stories and the mythology surrounding King Arthur are not in fact about him, or even really involve him at all. Indeed, one of the most well-known and famous stories of the Arthurian canon is Sir Gawain and the Green Knight, which we'll get into later, briefly, and Arthur plays an extremely minimal part in it. Likewise, when it comes to the love story of Lancelot and Guinevere, often Arthur actually plays the role of antagonist, or outright villain, driving his wife into the arms of another man and choosing to punish her violently and cruelly. However, it must be said that the tales and legends surrounding these secondary characters in Arthur's life are at best inconsistent, fascinating though they may be. Let's talk about Arthur's friends and enemies then, excluding magical people and creatures for now because there's a whole separate section later on for them. Alright, so cards on the table, I'm a lefty type, so obviously the very concept of a system in which all members of a group act as a collective and work towards a common goal without any kind of leadership, hierarchy or self-interest on the face of it is really quite interesting to me. However, it must be said that the so-called Knights of the Round Table are, well, not quite as equitable as people seem to think. I mean, one of them is the King, and the others follow his lead at all times, remember, and in many depictions of the table, Arthur has a throne while everyone else has ordinary chairs. In some depictions, it's argued that the original purpose was for it to stop quarrels between nobles under Arthur's command over who got to sit in seats of prominence, but again, a round table also has this issue since the closer to the king one may sit may denote more significance and therefore still implies a hierarchy of sort. Regardless, the idea of a round table is a nice one, though it's unclear exactly when it was added as no round table appears in the early Welsh text. There are several candidates suggested for what the round table might have been. A henge at Aimant Bridge near Penrith, Cumbria, is known as King Arthur Arthur's Round Table. The still visible Roman amphitheatre at Caerlon has been associated with the Round Table and it has been suggested as a possible source for the legend. Following archaeological discoveries at the Roman ruins in Chester, some writers suggested that the Chester Roman amphitheatre was the true prototype of the Round Table. However, the English Heritage Commission, acting as consultants to a History Channel documentary in which the claim was made, stated that there was no archaeological basis to the story. History Channel, am I right? Typical. I'm surprised they didn't blame aliens. There's also a lot of religious significance to the Round Table. And later Christian retellings, as rather than being carved out of wood by a carpenter in order to solve disputes between nobles, as in earlier versions of the legend, it is later claimed to have been created by Merlin the Wizard in imitation of the Table of the Last Supper, which was not round, but ignore that for now, and of Joseph of Arimathea's Grail Table, which was made of silver and was used by the followers of Arimathea after he created it as directed by a vision of Christ and was taken by him to Avalon, which is a whole thing, but more on Avalon and Arimathea later. This version of 
of the Round Table, here made for Arthur's father Uther Pendragon, rather than Arthur himself, has 12 seats and one empty place to mark the betrayal of Judas. This seat must remain empty until the coming of the knight who will achieve the Grail and is later filled by a disputed figure known as the Grail Knight, who first learns of its location and sets off the Grail quest. There are further versions of the legend in which the Round Table is kept by King Leo de Grants of Cameliard after Uther's death and Arthur inherits it back when he marries Leo de Grants' daughter Guinevere, yet more versions treat the Round Table differently. For example, Arthurian works from Italy like La Tavola Rotonda, or the Round Table, often distinguish between the knights of the old table of Uther's time and those of Arthur's new table, implying that both versions of the legend are true. In some versions, the table is eventually destroyed by a figure named King Mark during his invasion of Britain after the deaths of Arthur and almost all of the knights. Anyway, all this to say, the knights of the Round Table are supposedly selfless warriors fighting in the interest of the greater good of the country, but in practice this often simply didn't work out, and to be honest, the idea of the Round Table is likely just copied from historical reports of the court of Charlemagne, who is believed to have used a circular table featuring a map of Rome, and later writers just liked the idea and tried to make their own versions of it. In truth, the Round Table is not a symbol of equality or cooperation, but the idea of chivalry, which was beloved of people at the time as the highest, most honourable form of behaviour, in much the same way as weebs nowadays like to go on about the Code of Bushido. Some of the Knights of the Round Table have gone down in legend and become household names in their own right, achieving levels of fame and glory as well as infamy that could only have been imagined in the old legends. Let's go over some of the most well known, because there are honestly far too many to go over all of them here. Now, shall we? Sir Lancelot du Lac, whose name is just hilariously descriptive and went on to inspire world famous battle robot Sir Killalot. <laughs> was, according to legend, the son of King Ban of Benwick and Queen Elaine. Lancelot was the first knight of the Round Table and is renowned for never failing in gentleness, courtesy, selflessness or courage. It has been said that Lancelot was the greatest fighter and swordsman of all the knights of the Round Table, and yet he was also extremely intelligent and known for his charm and humour. Some versions of the legend tell us that, as a child, Lancelot was left by the shore of the lake, where he was found by the Lady of the Lake who fostered and raised him. He also, of course, famously betrayed his king and, having fallen for the Lady Gwyneth, either seduced or abducted her, causing her to be sentenced to death by fire, from which he rescued her, turning on and killing some of his fellow knights in the process, and the two of them left in exile and shame. More on Guinevere later, but it's impossible to mention Lancelot without bringing up this incident. As his call, Lancelot represented both the highs a man devoted to his king can reach, and also the depths to which he may fall when tempted into giving in to his passion. So Gawain is generally considered to be the nephew of King Arthur, as Gawain's parents are said to be King Lot of Orkney and Arthur's sister Morgan, or Morgos, though his mother is said to be someone else named Anna in Geoffrey of Monmouth's History of the Kings of Britain, but as we already established, that's not a source anyone should take seriously. Upon the death of King Lot, Gawain became the head of the Orkney clan, which includes in many sources his brothers Agravain, Gaheris, and Gareth, also major knights in Arthur's court, and of course his half-brother Mordred, who we'll talk about in a moment. Though Lancelot is often referred to as the greatest knight, depending on the source, Gawain is also referred to as the greatest knight of the round table on occasion, and is most recognised from Sir Gawain and the Green Knight, which is a whole, well it's a thing, and is arguably extremely gay, but more on this later. Generally, Sir Gawain is portrayed as the closest friend of Sir Lancelot, and in some legends, he seems to be the rightful heir to the throne of Camelot once King Arthur passes, which makes sense if he legitimately is Arthur's nephew. <laughs> Sir Galahad was the son of Sir Lancelot and Elaine. His name may be of Welsh origin or come from the place known of Gilead in Palestine, possibly a reference to the Crusades or indeed biblical canon. Born out of wedlock, he was placed in a nunnery as a child, being that the abbess there was his great aunt. He actually originally had his own version of the sword in the stone myth, wherein the sword was seen in a river by King Arthur's knights and legend stated that only the world's best knight could pull it out. Galahad was led into King Arthur's court where he sat in the Siege Perilous, the vacant seat at the 
round table reserved for the knight who would one day be successful at recovering the Holy Grail, which we just mentioned. Following his seat at the round table, Galahad then drew the sword from the stone. Years later, while at Arthur's court, the Holy Grail appeared in a vision to Galahad and showed him that he was one of the three knights chosen to undertake the quest for the Holy Grail. He was given a white shield by King Everlake with a red cross which Joseph of Arimathea had drawn in blood for some reason. A truly deep and fervent supporter of King Arthur from the very start, Sir Bedivere never waned in that support. Bedivere was also one of the first knights to join the Fellowship of the Round Table, and was by King Arthur's side at his death. He said to have been the one to transport him to the Isle of Avalon after his final battle. Sir Bedivere was also credited with helping King Arthur fight the giant of Mont Saint Michel, and later was made Duke of Neustria. Sir Bedivere lost one of his hands in battle and spent the rest of his life fighting with only one hand. Famously, he's the last remaining knight after the battle that ends the legend, and is the one to cast the sword Excalibur back into the lake from whence it came. Sir Geraint, who was the eldest son of King Urban of Dunmonia, was a knight of Devonshire. After the death of his first wife, Geraint spent much of his time at King Arthur's court looking for action and adventure. It was during this period that he encountered the Sparrowhawk Knight and ultimately came to marry Lady Enid of Curtaim, now known as Cardiff, a story in the ancient legends of Eric alias Geraint and Enid and Geraint Mab Urban. Honestly, I looked into it and this whole thing is much less exciting than it sounds. Some dude with a bird invites Geraint to a joust, he borrows some shitty armour from Enid's dad, the tournament anyway under a false name, and then marries Enid at the end. This particular story is an odd one though. At one point, Geraint heard Enid complaining that he was a lazy knight. He was so embarrassed that he accused Enid of cheating on him with a platonic friend, and to ease his conscience, Geraint took Enid on a journey through a series of trials until she convinced him of her faithfulness to him. Enid remained so devoted to Sir Geraint that ultimately they returned home and lived in happiness for the remainder of their lives. What a delightful tale of abuse, eh? Sergtor was a nobleman and knight who was entrusted with Arthur as a young child by Merlin the Magician, who in one particularly dark version of the tale had made a pact with Arthur's father, Uther, to enable him to seduce another man's wife with magic, in return for Uther handing over whatever offspring may result from this union to Merlin to do with as he pleased. Arthur grew up knowing Sir Ector as his father, and Ector remained clueless as to the true identity of the young Arthur. Sir Kay was also the son of Ector, and Kay and Arthur grew up together as brothers. Sir Ector always treated treated Arthur as his son and raised him in a respectable manner up until Arthur pulled the sword from the stone and then took his rightful place as King of England, and thereafter served faithfully as advisor and knight. Sir Kay was the son of Sir Ector and the foster brother of King Arthur. History records Kay, or Kai in Welsh, as being a very tall man and a fierce warrior, as shown by his epithet, the Tall. He appears in the Mapinogian tale of Kulich and Olwen as the foremost warrior at the court of King Arthur. According to other legends, Sir Kay had mystical powers and was called one of the three enchanter knights of Britain, all of whom were at one point or another knights of the round table, though Kay is the only one of note. Later on, this was written about Sir Kay. Nine knights Nine nights and nine days his breath lasted underwater. Nine nights and nine days would he be without sleep. A wound from Kai's sword no physician might heal. When it pleased him, he would be as tall as the tallest tree in the forest. When the rain was heaviest, whatever he held in his hand would be dry for a handbreadth before and behind. Because of the greatness of his heat, and when his companions were coldest, he would be as fuel for them to light a fire. Sir Percival was a working class lad, raised by his mother in ignorance of arms, chivalric arts and courtesy, yet because of his upbringing, Percival was one of the most gracious and innocent of the knights of the round table. Percival's natural prowess in combat ultimately led him to King Arthur's court, where he immediately set off in pursuit of a knight who had offended Queen Guinevere. Bit of a brown nose if you ask me, but he meant well I suppose. Percival was the Grail Knight, or one of the Grail Knights, in numerous medieval and modern stories of the Grail quest. Guinevere. Like yours, my lady, like yours. 
Everyone makes mistakes, and sometimes in a monogamous relationship, people falter and fall for other people outside of their marriage or relationship. Maybe that's a deal breaker, and maybe succumbing to these desires or feelings is worthy of a breakup or weeks and months of couples counselling and trust therapy sessions. But we can probably agree that if your wife fucks your best friend, setting her on fire is a bit of an overreaction, right? Well, such was the fate of Queen Guinevere, who fell for Sir Lancelot, gave in to temptation, and paid the ultimate price. Let's ignore that Arthur also cheated on her and had a son with his own sister whilst married to Guinevere though, eh? The theme of infidelity is an important one in this story. Arthur is conceived due to infidelity and his father's lust overcoming sense, his darkest hour happens when someone close to him commits infidelity upon him, and his downfall comes when the fruit of his own infidelity, Mordred, returns to strike his father down and end his reign. But who was Guinevere? The woman Arthur loved so much he set her on fire. Well, she rarely if ever appears in the early stories, and if she does exist it's only in passing, but over the centuries she's gradually given more and more agency and character. For example, in Marie de France's probably late 12th century Anglo-Norman poem L'Anfal, and Thomas Chester's later Middle Age version Sir L'Anfal, Guinevere is a vindictive adulteress and temptress who plots the titular protagonist's death after failing to seduce him. She ends up punished when she is magically blinded by his secret true love from Avalon, the fairy princess Lady Triamore, identified by some as the figure of Morgan le Fay. Guinevere herself wields magical powers in the story The Rise of Gawain, Nephew of Arthur. Likewise, depictions of her death are varied and inconsistent. For example, in the Italian 15th century romance La Tavola Rotonda, Guinevere drops dead from grief upon learning of her husband's fate after Lancelot rescues her from the siege by Mordred. In Perla's Vals, it is the murder of her son Loholt that causes Guinevere to die of anguish, and she is then buried in Avalon with her son's severed head. Alternatively, in what Arthurian scholars Geoffrey Ash and Norris J. Lacey call one of the strange episodes of Le Mureur de Histoires, a romanticised historical or legendary work by Belgian author Jean Dutremose, Guinevere is a wicked queen who rules with the victorious Mordred until she is killed by Lancelot, here the last of the Knights of the Round Table. Her corpse is then entombed with the captured Mordred who eats it before starving to death. Lyamon's Brute features a prophetic dream sequence in which Arthur himself hacks Guinevere to pieces after beheading Mordred. But of course, we all know what Guinevere is best known for, her affair with Sir Lancelot. In some of the earlier stories, Lancelot's stepmother, Ninian, the Lady of the Lake, gifts them an identical pair of magical rings of protection against enchantment. In this version, the lovers spend their first night together, just as Arthur sleeps with the beautiful Saxon princess named Camille, or Gamille, an evil enchantress whom he later continues to love even after she betrays and imprisons him, though it was suggested that he was just enchanted. Arthur is also further and faithful during the episode of the false Guinevere, who had Arthur drink a love potion to betray Guinevere, her own twin half-sister, born on the same day but from a different mother, weird, whom Arthur takes as his second wife in a very unpopular bigamous move, even refusing to obey the Pope's order for him not to do it as Guinevere escapes to live with Lancelot. The reason for these weird choices were essentially an attempt to justify Guinevere and Lancelot's adultery by worsening Arthur's reputation, making him a real asshole, thus making it acceptable and sympathetic for their medieval courtly French audience, in the same way that nowadays we might reasonably see a woman in an abusive relationship escaping through romance with another lover as sympathetic, and with good reason. Some versions actually don't condemn the affair, but do very much criticise the blatantness of it all. For example, in Le Mort d'Arthur, Mallory tells his readers that the pair started behaving carelessly in public, or even that Lancelot wanted Guinevere more than he cared for his knightly duties and, of course, quest, stating that Lancelot began to resort into Queen Guinevere again and forget the promise and the perfection that he made in the quest, and so they loved together more hotter than they did beforehand. They indulged in privy drafts together and behaved in such a way that many of the courts spoke of it. Of course, the affair is finally exposed by Morgan Le Fay, who had schemed against Guinevere on various occasions, sometimes being full in that by Lancelot, who'd also defended Guinevere on many other occasions and performed assorted feats in her honour, because Morgan loves to fuck with the Pendragons from time to time. Revealed as a betrayer of his king and friend, Lancelot fights and escapes. Incited to defend honour, Arthur sentences his wife to be burned at the stake. Lancelot arrives with his kinsmen and followers and rescues the queen. Gawain's unarmed brothers, Gaheris and Gareth, are killed in the battle. Guinevere later returns to Arthur from Lancelot's castle and is forgiven. When Arthur goes after Lancelot to France, he leaves her in the care of Mordred, who plans to marry the queen himself and take Arthur's throne. While in some versions of the legend, like the alliterative Mort Arthur, which removed French romantic additions, Guinevere assents to Mordred's proposal, in the tales of Lancelot she hides in the Tower of London, where she withstands Mordred's siege, 
and later takes refuge in a convent. Hearing of the treachery, Arthur returns to Britain and slays Mordred at Camlan, but his wounds are so severe that he is taken to the Isle of Avalon by Morgan to die. During the Civil War, Guinevere is portrayed as a scapegoat for violence without developing her perspective or motivation. However, after Arthur's death, Guinevere retires to a convent in penitence for her infidelity to find her salvation in a life of penance. Her contrition is sincere and permanent. Lancelot is unable to sway her to come away with him. Guinevere meets Lancelot one final time, refusing to kiss him and then returns to the convent. She spends the remainder of her life as an abbess in joyless sorrow, contrasting with her earlier merry nature. Following her death, Lancelot buries her next to Arthur's, real or symbolic, grave. Mordred, otherwise known as Mordredus, is a knight of the round table, a capable warrior and, unbeknownst to everyone but Morgan Le Fay, Arthur's secret, incestuous, illegitimate son. Mordred is usually portrayed as a great warrior, like all knights of Arthur's court, but an unnecessarily brutal one who took perverse pleasure in cruelty, lustful actions such as rape, and was widely considered a bit of a dickhead. Generally, he attempts, by persuasion or force, to coerce Guinevere to becoming his lover and to usurp the throne, again either by diplomatic nonsense, marriage, or just in invading Britain with a mercenary force, and his mother's magic behind him, standing in for the Saxons in some versions of the story. This is usually how Arthur dies, in battle with his own son. The magic of Merlin and the old gods matched by that of Morgan Le Fay, and his skill in combat and leadership more than surpassed by the much younger, less honourable man. During this conflict, both men land a fatal blow on the other, Mordred dying immediately and Arthur, slowly bleeding out, lives just long enough to instruct Sir Bedivere to toss Excalibur into the lake and take Arthur's body to Avalon. There's not much more to be said about Mordred, really. He mostly exists as a kind of antichrist figure, a betrayer and a representation of Arthur's lapse in judgement and moral failing. This is ramped up to an absurd degree in the version of the story in which, in a seemingly deliberate reference to the biblical massacre of the innocents, Arthur is told a cryptic prophecy by Merlin about a just-born child that is to be his undoing, and so he tries to avert his fate by ordering his men to massacre all the Mayday newborn. To this end, they place them all on a ship set to sink and the children drown. Yet, unknown to Arthur, the baby Mordred actually miraculously survived. He's accidentally found and rescued by a fisherman and his wife, who then raise him as their own son. Interestingly, in this version, Mordred is cast as a sort of Christ or Moses-like figure, and Arthur as the evil King Herod, which, considering that Arthur in most later versions of the story is portrayed as a god-fearing Christian man, and Mordred exists as an extension of Morgan Le Fay, the representative of the old gods, this is a very confusing reference. Of course, the more common version of the story just has Morgan seduce Arthur into impregnating her and raising their son in secret to hate his father. Whatever version you prefer, however, the core is what's important. Patricide and incest babies. Fun for the whole family. Your whole life I tried to prepare you for the day you would become king. Did you learn nothing? Uther Pendragon is generally portrayed as Arthur's father, though there are a number of different forms his role in Arthur's life can take. In the modern TV show Merlin, for example, Uther is king and Arthur is his only son and there's no issue with succession or anything. Arthur is just born a prince and becomes king when his father dies. In other versions of the story, Uther is the rightful king but leaves no heirs other than Arthur, who is born in secret or illegitimate in some way, and when he dies it's Arthur pulling the sword from the stone that sets things right and he's able to succeed to the throne. The most common an early version of the tale, however, is that of a jealous, manipulative king who makes a deal with Merlin to magically disguise himself as a rival lord in order to seduce and sleep with said lord's wife, with the catch being that Merlin gets to raise the child that results of this union, and I don't know, maybe they just couldn't convince Anthony Stewart Head to do that scene or something. In Geoffrey of Monmouth's version of the history, Uther is the youngest son of the previous king. At some point before his older brother can take the throne, he is murdered at the instigation of his advisor Vortigern, another character who sometimes plays a major role as chief antagonist and sometimes just never shows up at all, depending on who's telling the story, who seizes the throne for himself. Uther and his other brother, still children, flee to Brittany. Vortigern makes an alliance with the Saxons under Hengist, but it goes disastrously wrong. Uther returns years later, now an adult. Aurelius, Uther's brother, burns Vortigern in his castle and becomes king. With Aurelius on the throne, Uther travels to Ireland to help Merlin bring the stones of Stonehenge from there to Britain. Later, while Aurelius is ill, Uther leads his army against Vortigern's son 
Patient and his Saxon allies. On the way to the battle, he sees a comet in the shape of a dragon, which Merlin interprets as an omen, predicting Aurelius' death and Uther's glorious future. Uther wins the battle, takes the epithet Pendragon, and returns to find that Aurelius has died, leaving Uther to take the throne. The figure of Uther is minor but important. He rarely plays a large part in the story, and he rarely, if ever, actually has a large role in how it plays out, but without Uther, there would be no Arthur, and his choices set the stage for Arthur to take his place as the legendary king. However, it must be said, he's definitely not all that bothered about magic. He's close friends and allies with a literal wizard, for fuck's sake. Yet more proof that the TV show Merlin is simply not historically accurate in the slightest. I'm shocked, I tell you. Shocked! Would it surprise you to learn that if you look up resources about the Fae, their associated legends and history on YouTube, you get a lot of weird stuff like this definitely Photoshop monstrosity. Probably not, but to be honest, it's mostly harmless, and I did find a delightful channel where an elderly man, who may as well be a wizard, acts like some kind of bird watcher but for fairies and inserts them with actually surprisingly good CGI into shots. Just keep watching up behind me on that ledge. Focus it. And I think I've got the right spot. Hold, hold on. Yeah. Ah. Oh. He's just there. Ah, you see? That was a quick glimpse there. Ah. Okay. Uh, he's not there. Oh, sorry about that. He was, he was doing a. Oh, there he is. Okay, let's. <laughs> there. Ah, well, at least we've got a shot of of one. Which, to be honest, I would usually be critical of, but most people seem to be in on the joke and it's a fun bit of whimsical storytelling, so of course I subscribed immediately. I don't want to disparage or attack anyone for their religion, of course. I may not necessarily agree with pagans or their religion, but I also do not tolerate mocking of anyone for their religion, so if I see anyone pagan bashing in the comments, your post will be deleted. I don't care how silly stuff like this may seem, it's no more or less weird than claiming to be able to speak to angels and at least witches don't try to ban gay marriage based on the phase teaching. Anyway, let's talk about magic with a K, spirits and the old gods in this section. In a land of myth and a time of magic, the destiny of a great kingdom rests on the shoulders of a young boy. His name... Merlin. One of Merlin's primary abilities and magical skills is his gift of foresight and uncanny ability to see far into the future. In the film The Sword in the Stone, he's actually seen as somewhat of a time traveller in fact. And of course, this originates from our old friend Geoffrey of Monmouth who wrote an entire book of prophecies Merlin supposedly made throughout his life, many of which seem to predict things happening in Geoffrey's lifetime, strangely, but over the centuries the mystique of Merlin has exceeded that of mere soothsayer or scryer. In some versions of the story he's an ageless godlike being, the true power behind the throne, and sometimes he ages backwards and occasionally just shows up and starts blasting people left, right and centre, like some kind of fucking D&D wizard or something. Oh, and sometimes he's in a homoerotic bromance with Arthur and looks exactly like cops hate Mo. Anyway, first thing to point out is that Merlin was likely not a wizard because, well, wizards aren't real. What he was, however, is probably some kind of priest, holy man or druid of the ancient Celtic religion, which to the eyes of later Christian readers in the Middle Ages, may have seemed very similar to magic in a number of ways. The Romans certainly saw it that way when they encountered the Druids, which is one of the many reasons why they persecuted them so heavily. In Geoffrey of Monmouth's imagining, Merlin was the offspring of an incubus or sex demon and a human woman, thus explaining his magical powers and of course only demons can possess magic. He was, as a result, a sort of antichrist figure but was later baptised by a priest, thus ridding him of his evil side but enabling him to keep his magical abilities. He also created Stonehenge by levitating rocks 
looks just like Ancient Aliens said. He gains the ability to shapeshift at some point and apparently had a great sense of humour, at least according to some French versions of the legend, so I guess he'd be the sort of guy he could go for a pint with, which is nice. Anyway, Merlin, like many elderly men in positions of power, had a weakness for younger women, specifically his apprentice Morgan Le Fay, though they never actually become an item or indeed quarrel, it's just a bit awkward. Instead, his undoing comes when he falls for a young woman named Vivian, or occasionally Nimue, who is sometimes also cast in the part of the Lady of the Lake. She begs Merlin to teach her his ways and seduces him. Eventually, when she's learned all that she can from him, she uses one of his own spells to either kill or imprison him forever and takes his place at Arthur's side as court wizard. Her exact motivations are unclear and vary from text to text, but the two most prominent versions of the story are a reaction from fear of Merlin and his lustful advances and protecting her own virginity, or simple jealousy for his relationship with Morgan Le Fay. This is further complicated when we consider that, like Morgan, Nimue is posited to be a fey creature, so this could all just be fey mischief or such like. It's witchcraft, wicked witchcraft. Morgana, Morgoz, or Morgan Le Fay is generally portrayed as an evil sorceress, mostly influenced by Middle Ages women bad logic, in which women are untrustworthy and lustful, which makes them seem less worthy in the eyes of God or something, but above all, human. She is, after all, generally considered to be Arthur's half-sister. But let's not forget the Le Fay part, which literally translates to the fairy or Lady of Fay. Anyone who knows anything about the mythology and superstition surrounding the Fay knows that they are not to be fucked with in any way, shape or form, and for good reason. They'll steal your children, replace them with a doppelganger, tear out your eyes, familiarly perceiving them, and make you dance all night so you never get any sleep and eventually die of sleep deprivation and exhaustion simply for cruel amusement and mischief. Morgan, for her part, is often referred to as a fairy queen and does appear to be a remnant of supernatural women from Celtic mythology. For example, her name could be connected to the myths of Morgans, with an E, also known as Mary Morgans or just Morgans with an A, Welsh and Breton fairy water spirits. Whilst many later works make Morgan specific human, she retains her magical powers and sometimes also her otherworldly, if not divine, attribute. In fact, she is often referred to as a goddess by some medieval authors. However, she is definitively given human ancestry and shares a mother with Arthur, who as we previously established was conceived as a result of magical sexual assault, basically. Significant inspiration for Morgan's character likely came from Welsh folklore and medieval Irish literature and hagiography. Speculatively, Morgan has been connected with the Irish shape-shifting and multi-faced goddess of strong known as the Morrigan, or Great Queen, a name you probably recognise if you've ever played Dragon Age Origins, possible influence by elements of the classical Greek mythology, sorceresses or goddesses such as Circe and especially Medea, who, similar to Morgan, are often alternatively benevolent and malicious, and other magical women from Irish mythology such as the mother of the hero Freck, as well as the historical figure of Empress Matilda, have also been suggested. Morgan's primary role in the legend, of course, other than just fucking with Arthur for no reason, is to, well, fuck Arthur for a very specific reason, to demonstrate that he is capable of faltering morally, to prove that this virtuous man is not all he appears, and to conceive a bastard son who is destined to be his undoing, Mordred, son of Arthur by his own half-sister and de facto heir to the throne of Camelot. So kind of like the Joker in the film The Dark Knight, except not at all. I took Gotham's white knight, and I brought him down to our level. It wasn't hard. See, madness, as you know, is like gravity. All it takes is a little push. <laughs> <laughs> I'm bailiff, I'm the gardener. I work from early dawn. You find me sweeping up the leaves and tidying the lawn. Ah. The Green Knight is another figure most likely attributable to origins with the Fae. Indeed, he certainly demonstrates powers far beyond that of mere mortals, including the ability to shapeshift at will, a skill and affinity for manipulation and mischief, and some scholars believe him to be a manifestation of the Green Man, sometimes known as Jack in the Green, a legendary figure and Celtic deity, primarily interpreted as a symbol of rebirth, representing the cycle of new growth that occurs every spring, who is generally portrayed as a living embodiment of foliage, a sort of 
tree man and definitely very pagan in nature. This theory is further supported by the fact that he carries a green holly branch and the comparison of his beard to a bush within many texts as well as his home known as the Green Chapel being arguably quite reminiscent of old tales of fairy hills or barrows of earlier Celtic literature helps solidify this interpretation. Others, however, rather boringly, consider him as being an incarnation of the Christian devil. And there definitely are medieval depictions of the devil with green skin out there, although once again this could easily be attributed to another example of an early pagan influence co-opted and changed by the church to better fit with Christian iconography whilst allowing the story itself to continue. Indeed, it is definitely true that the early church at one point simply declared the fey a kind of demon or devil, effectively subsuming thousands of years of superstition in order to assimilate these ancient beliefs into their comparatively new dominant religion to ease conversion efforts, so both these theories could perceivably be true at the same time. Also, it can't really be ignored that the story in which he is most familiar to us, Sir Gawain and the Green Knight, is deliberately and obviously sexually subversive in a way that's both clear to us now and also would have been to people in the Middle Ages when the poem was produced as well. I won't go into a whole thing about it here because this video is already quite long and others have already done that, but suffice to say that, in my personal opinion, the Green Knight basically existed to fuck with this powerful manly knight of the round table, emasculate him, have him seduced by either his wife or himself in disguise, depending on which interpretation you believe, and just vigorously make out with him on multiple occasions. I am a giant. Stand up on my shoulders. One well-known tale concerns Rita or Ruda Gawa, a king of the giants who held court in Snowdonia. Seeking power and land, he marched against and defeated warring local human kings, Ninwa and Pibao, overwhelmed their armies and hilariously took their beards as trophies of his victory and fashioned them into a hat. According to the story, the 26 kings of Britain assembled their armies to destroy Rita but were vanquished by the giant who cut off all the king's beards and fashioned a great cape out of them to protect him from the cold. Sometime later, as Arthur, by this point an accomplished slayer of monsters, washed his hands after slaying the red-eyed giant of Kernu, received a message from Ritter demanding his beard to patch his cloak. Arthur refused and Ritter marched south with his armies to claim it from him. In the resulting confrontation, Ritter is forced to shear his own beard and retreats much humbled in stature but much wiser in knowledge. A variant tale claims that after receiving the demands, Arthur marched furiously up to Snowdonia and fought against the giant in a duel in which he lifted up his sword and struck Ritter on the crown of the head a blow so fiercely wounding, severely venomous and sternly smiting that it cut through all his head armour and his skin and his flesh and clove him in twain. According to the story, Arthur commands that a cairn be built over his body which forms Gwydfaruda or Rita's cairn or as we now know it today, Mount Snowdonia. Arthur's legend is far more episodic in nature than many believe. In fact, in a 2007 academic study, historian Caitlin Green identified three strands of the portrayal of Arthur in the early Welsh legends that spoke of him. First, that he was a peerless warrior who functioned as the monster-hunting protector of Britain from all internal and external threats, both human, such as the Saxons, but primarily actually supernatural, including giant cat monsters, powerful and possibly divine boars, dragons, dog heads, which are exactly what you'd expect, dudes with the head of dogs, giants and witches. The second is that Arthur was a figure of folklore, and localised magical wonder tale, the leader of a band of superhuman heroes who live in the wilds of Wales. The third and final strand is that of the Welsh Arthur, who had a close relationship with the Welsh Otherworld, Anwen, otherwise known as the Fey Kingdom. On the one hand, he launches assaults on otherworldly fortresses in search of treasure and frees their prisoners. On the other, his warband in the early sources includes former pagan gods, and his wife and his possessions are clearly otherworldly in origin. Arthur then is and always has been magical and in tune with Celtic spirituality and it's fascinating that we seem so keen to forget these connections. You forget I'm the lady of the lake. I'm made of water. Now everything's flowing away from us. This is an interesting one because whilst this character is usually known as the Lady of the Lake, she's by no means unique. Indeed, there have been multiple Ladies of Lakes throughout medieval literature and it seems like this is simply a reflection of ancient Celtic beliefs regarding water spirits and guardians of large bodies of water. For example, we know that Sir Lancelot was raised by a water spirit after being adopted by her following his family's death, teaching him arts and writing, infusing him with wisdom and courage, and overseeing his training 
training to become an unsurpassed warrior, which, due to timey-wimey bullshit, all takes her only a few years in the human world. She then sends Lancelot off to King Arthur's court as the nameless White Knight, due to her own affinity with the colour white. Once he achieves this, she keeps aiding Lancelot in various ways during his early adventures, usually acting through her servants, agents, and messengers. She gives him magical gifts, including a magical ring of protection against enchantments. Later, she also works to actively encourage Lancelot and Guinevere's relationship and its consummation. This includes sending Guinevere a symbolically illustrated magical shield, the crack in which closes up after the Queen finally spends her first night with Lancelot, and furthermore personally arrives to restore Lancelot to sanity during some of his recurring fits of madness. However, it's unclear if this Lady of the Lake is the same one as Merlin's treacherous lover Nimue, or indeed the watery tart distributing swords of Monty Python's retelling. Considering the context and the origins of these legends and myths, it's likely that they're not, and that all these water spirits of the old religion happen to just interact with the same couple of people, or, considering that Arthur was a Celtic hero and these are Celtic gods he was fighting to protect from the cultural hegemony of the Anglo-Saxon's Christian beliefs, perhaps not quite so coincidental. Though later, and especially modern retellings of the story, do heavily imply or just outright state that they are the same person or entity in all cases for the sake of simplicity. Regardless, it's important to remember that for the Celts, large bodies of water, which may have provided many important aspects or parts of their way of life, and seemed mysterious and beautiful, held a lot of spiritual significance, and the Lady of the Lake would have been a deity of quite some significance for many at the time, though she likely would have been the god of one specific body of water, and other lakes would have had other gods. The symbolism of a god of the old ways handing over a sword to use against the enemy of their way of life, and casting it back into the water after the death of Arthur, the protector of traditions and gods of the Celts, is tragically, painfully poignant, in my opinion. Speaking of magic swords, let's talk about Moistened Bint's lobbing scimitar as a basis for a civilized society. Whoso pulleth out this sword of this stone and anvil is rightwise king born of England. As a wise and definitely not completely off his rocker man once said, When I hear a story about this magnificent sword that's encased in stone, with only the handle sticking out and only King Arthur has the capability to pull it out, well, then I start thinking about some kind of biometric security system, where today we now have guns that can only be fired if the handle recognises your fingerprint. Is it possible that the sword in the stone was calibrated specifically to King Arthur's biometrics? I think yes. I know it sounds crazy, but we're merely saying that what today is being discovered is a rediscovery of what already took place that thousands of years ago. Alright, so obviously that's ridiculous, but let's for a moment talk about magic swords, of which Arthur arguably had two, the famous sword in the stone, and the blade Excalibur, gifted to him by the Lady of the Lake. As we just established, lakes and bodies of water would have held particular spiritual significance for Celtic figures like Arthur, but so would the very concept of a magical sword in general, so let's discuss that for a bit. In all likelihood, the root of the myth of the magic sword stems from ancient people's beliefs that sword making and metallurgy was in fact a magical process, and to be honest I can't blame them for that. Through the fires of the forge, and in many cultures fire was also given spiritual connotations, a lump of what was basically earth or rock was transformed into a beautiful, shining, usable object that could be hammered or forged into many shapes, and the amount of time and skill required to forge a good quality blade, at least before the invention of new techniques and processes later on, meant that to most people it may as well have been a form of magic. Further, while just about any blacksmith could manufacture a basic tool like a knife, or simple weapon like an axe, head, only a swordsmith, the most highly skilled of smiths, could create a high quality sword, and considering the pattern welding these weapons often boasted, the beauty could not be denied. Additionally, to avoid competition, the secrets of individual smiths' methods and formulas were often jealously guarded, increasing the mystique for the average person. This was not a belief that the swordsmiths themselves were immune to, of course. Indeed, the skill necessary to forge a balanced blade, one which is not too brittle or too soft, or would have been able to hold a usefully sharp edge, in the age before automated machines, blast furnaces, and the knowledge of molecular chemistry made the creation of a sword seem almost miraculous. A few degrees too hot or too cold within a very limited temperature range, which could only be discerned by the glowing hue of a hot billet, could make or break a sword. A lack of expertise in knowing when and how to apply carbon and flux and quench the blade could ruin weeks of work, as anyone who's ever seen the TV show Forged in Fire can attest. Overall, your bagnat will kill. Overall, your weapon will kill. Your blade, it will kill. Your blade, it's curvaceous and sexy, and it will kill. Overall, your weapon will kill. Overall, sir, your weapon 
will kill. Thus, the swordsmith may have definitely felt a spiritual, even religious connection to his craft. This led to the belief that he was actually imbuing the blade with an essence of his spirit. In ancient Japan, for example, the swordsmiths were so concerned with his belief that they would undergo purification rituals and meditation before even attempting to start a new blade, for fear that they might inadvertently create an evil sword. The Vikings, likewise, prized their swords above all other things, handing them down from generation to generation and giving them often overly specific names. My favourite historical example is the sword called the Slinger of the Fire of the Storm of the Troll Woman of the Shielding Moon of the Horse of Boathouses. I'm sure it makes a lot more sense in Old Norse. The value of the blade was not only determined by its quality, but also how many battles that it was used in. Polynesian people, such as the Maori, also had comparable reverence for their weapons. They believed that a weapon contained a spiritual force called mana, and that the weapon held the spirits of its maker, its line of owners, and also stole the spirits of those it killed, which later inspired the best line in the entire DC Cinematic Universe. I would advise not getting killed by her. Her sword traps the souls of its victims. Harley Quinn, nice to meet ya. Accordingly, these weapons were highly prized for their manner and cherished as heirlooms, in the same way ancestral swords were in medieval Europe. The samurai of Japan believed that their swords had their own soul and could possess them during battle, and that in many ways it was not the wielder but their swords that desired to kill. Samurai were just the instrument that the sword would use to complete that task. Since most of them were Buddhists, a religion that finds violence and murder abhorrent, the argument is that this gave them some kind of peace of mind and internal justification in their choice to go into to a profession, they required one to kill and be good at it too. Later, as the concept of demons, spiritual possession, and elementals became more common within local mythological themes, it was also a natural leap to attribute magical properties of the swords of folklore to indwelling spirits. But what of Excalibur? Well, the name Excalibur ultimately derives from the Welsh Caladfulch, which is a compound of calad or hard and bulch or breach or cleft, literally hard cleave. Caladfulch appears in several early Welsh works, including the prose tale Culloch and Olwen from the 11th and 12th century. The name was later used in Welsh adaptations of foreign material such as the Brutes or Chronicles, which were based on Geoffrey of Monmouth. It is often considered to be related to the phonetically similar Calad Bolg, a sword borne by several figures from Irish mythology, though a borrowing of Calad Fult from Calad Bolg has been considered unlikely by some. Regardless, through various translations we eventually end up with Excalibur, Excalibur, and finally the familiar Excalibur, after it was translated into Old French and back a few times. In this French source, Chrétien de Troyes, late 12th century Old French Perceval, is actually Sir Gawain who carries the sword Excalibur, and at one point it is stated, throughout his belt hung Excalibur, the finest sword that there ever was, which sliced through iron as through wood. Obviously, later on in the telling of the legend, Excalibur would be carried by Arthur himself. Though not named as Excalibur or any of his other names, Arthur's sword is described vividly in The Dream of Ronabru, one of the ancient Welsh tales associated with the Mabinogion, as translated by Geoffrey Gantz. And then they heard Cadre, Earl of Cornwall, being summoned and saw him rise with Arthur's sword in hand with the design of two chimeras on the golden hilt. When the sword was unsheathed, what was seen from the mouth of the two chimeras was like two flames of fire, so dreadful that it was not easy for anyone to look. Later retellings added a whole extra dimension to the legend of the sword involving Merlin and magical shenanigans. In many versions, Excalibur's blade was engraved with phrases on opposite sides, take me up and cast me away, or similar. In addition, it's said that when Excalibur was first drawn, in the first battle testing Arthur's sovereignty, his blade shined so bright it blinded his enemies. In some versions, Excalibur's scabbard was also said to have powers of its own, as any wounds received while wearing the scabbard would not bleed at all, thus preventing the wearer from ever bleeding to death in battle. For this reason, Merlin chides Arthur for preferring the sword over the scabbard, saying that the latter is the greater treasure. In the later romance tradition, including Mallory's Le Mort d'Arthur, the scabbard is stolen from Arthur by his half-sister Morgan Le Fay in revenge for the death of her lover, slain by Arthur with Excalibur in a duel, is then thrown by her into a lake and lost. This of course then later enables the death of Arthur, deprived of its magical protection, many years later in his final battle. In Mallory's telling, the scabbard is never found again. In later versions of the story, however, it is recovered and claimed by another magical being, Marsik, who then briefly gives it to Gawain to help him fight Naborn, or Mabon, the Enchanter. Morgan also secretly makes at least one duplicate of Excalibur during the time when the sword is entrusted to her by Arthur, later in the different French, Iberian, and English variants of that story. Excalibur is not Arthur's only weapon and 
legend, however, though it is the most significant and the most enduring. Indeed, several other weapons have been associated with Arthur. Welsh tradition also mentions a dagger named Carn Wenon and a spear named Rongonmiad that belonged to him. Carn Wenon, Little White Hilt, first appears in the story College and Onwen when Arthur uses it to slice the witch Ordu in half. Rongonmiad, which is a combination of the words for spear and striker or slayer, is also mentioned in Kulich, though only in passing. It appears as simply Ron, or Spear, in Geoffrey's Historia. Geoffrey also names Arthur's shield as Pridwen. In Kulich, however, Pridwen, or Fairface, is the name of Arthur's ship, while his shield is named... Jesus Christ, that's a long word. Um, okay, let's, let's give this a go. Wine Geberthutche, or Face of the Evening. In the alliterative Mort Arthur, a Middle English poem, Clarence is the royal sword of peace meant for knighting and ceremonies as opposed to battle, which Mordred stole and then used to kill Arthur in their final confrontation. The prose Lancelot mentions a sword called Sequence, also Cesseis or Seur, as borrowed from Arthur by Lancelot. You may also notice that there's been very little mention of the Christian god here. I wonder why that is. Perhaps because giving out magical swords isn't something Jesus makes a habit of doing, though angels apparently have the ability to make flaming and presumably also other kinds of swords, they never passed them on to humans, but the old gods of Celtic mythology absolutely did. The West Country of England home to some of the most enigmatic and imposing sites of prehistoric mystery. Stonehenge, Avery and Silbury Hill, to name but a few. Each steeped in mystery and legend. But there is one that stands quite literally above them all. It is called the Isle of Avalon. It would be difficult, if not impossible, to discuss Arthur without talking about his death or mentioning the legendary site of Avalon, believed to have been the entrance to the land of the fairies or simply the land of the dead in the Celtic spiritual belief system where he was supposedly laid to rest and from which he would, according to legend, return when his kingdom needed him most. More on that aspect of the legend in a moment, but first let's talk about Avalon because it's a really interesting place and yes, it probably is a real place. Nowadays, the site referred to as Avalon is believed to be a large hill in Glastonbury named Glastonbury Tor, sporting a tall stone structure, though this is a replacement for the original, which was destroyed in a natural disaster in the 7th century, not far from other sites of mystical and important Celtic significance such as Stonehenge, Avebury and Silbury Hill. And despite today apparently just being a large hill, at one time it was indeed an island, surrounded by a gigantic lake, accessible only by boat. Now, it's important that I emphasise the religious and cultural significance of the historical site of Avalon, because remember, Arthur would have believed heavily in what could be described as the Old God gods, and therefore the honour of being laid to rest at Avalon would not have been lost on the Celts who told the story, and the idea that a great warrior laid to rest here might one day return wouldn't have been completely implausible either. Avalon was believed to be where the entrance to the land of the fairies lay, and within it was the fairy king and his cauldron of life, which would grant immortality and health to all who drank from it, which should sound familiar to anyone who knows anything about the Grail quest. Over the centuries it became more and more solidified in the popular imagination that Avalon, and Glastonbury more broadly, was a mystical spiritual place, an identification that continues strongly today. In more recent times, some have formed theories based on perceived links between Glastonbury and Celtic legends of the other world in attempts to link the location firmly with Avalon, drawing on the various legends based on Glastonbury Tor, as well as, rather amusingly, drawing on pseudo-spiritual ideas like earth mysteries, alien conspiracies, like implying that aliens visit this specific hill on the regular for some reason, ley lines, ever the crackpot idea, though interestingly, St. Michael's Mount, another possible site of Avalon also has a lot of leyline conspiracies surrounding it, and even the myth of Atlantis. There's even Christian conspiracies surrounding it, like the one time Glastonbury Abbey's monks claimed to have found Arthur's body in the 12th century, only for it to turn out to be a hoax, as I mentioned earlier, or of course the fact that it was supposedly the home of the Holy Grail. The Grail itself is a weird one, but I refuse to make this video any longer by going on a whole aside about religious artefacts here. Maybe in another video we can talk about it, and we'll bring up all the different churches that claim to have Jesus's foreskin as well. Probably the wildest one though is the apparently widely held belief at one time that Joseph of Arimathea, possibly Jesus's uncle, though this connection is disputed, both brought Jesus to Britain as a child for some reason and returned as an old man after Jesus's death with the Holy Grail to place it in Avalon. This is the origin of the famous William Blake did those feet in ancient times bit, which for those unaware goes like this. And did those feet in ancient time walk upon England's mountains green and was the holy lamb of God on England's pleasant pastures seen. Various strands of this variation on 
the myth are set around Glastonbury Abbey. When Joseph arrived in Britain, he is said to have landed on the island of Avalon and climbed up to Wirral Hill. Exhausted, he thrust his staff into the ground and rested. By morning, his staff had taken root, and the remnants of it are now a tree at the Abbey grounds known today as the Holy Thorn. With his 12 followers, Joseph established the first monastery at Glastonbury and built the first church in Britain. In the versions of the story in which Christ himself travelled with Joseph from the Holy Land, he's said to have helped him in the building work, being a carpenter by trade. Don't ask how he could have helped construct a building to help people worship a religion that wouldn't exist until after he died. It's not worth your time, I promise you. Whatever the case, there is significance to the choice to have Avalon be the resting place of a figure named Arthur, and it showcases the way in which the church were able to co-opt and assimilate pagan and Celtic legends into the teaching of Christianity, much like in the way the winter solstice was co-opted and popularised as Christmas, legends of the spirit world and the fairy king inhabiting Glastonbury Tor were able to be changed and subsumed into the Christian iconography. The cauldron of life, believed to be hidden within the fairy world, became the Holy Grail, and the site itself was definitely significant and magical and spiritual, just for different, correct Christian reasons, and so on. But all this talk of the legends of Avalon cannot be done without mentioning the elephant in the room, which is, well... Generally, the legend of King Arthur has him die in battle at the hands of his illegitimate incest-born son, Mordred, at which point he demands that the sword Excalibur be cast into the lake from whence it came, in accordance with ancient Celtic beliefs, and he is taken to the Isle of Avalon to either be laid to rest or recover from his wounds, but be confined to the island, depending on the version of the story, though this is usually where his legend ends either way. There's actually a lot of speculation regarding the supernatural or religious elements of this part of the story, interestingly enough, in the telling of alliterative of Mort Arthur, relatively devoid of supernatural elements, it's renowned physicians from Salerno who try and fail to save Arthur's life in Avalon. Conversely, the guest of Regum Britannia, an early rewrite of Geoffrey's Historia, states in the present tense that Morgan keeps his healed body for her very own and they now live together. In a similar narrative, the chronicle Draco Nomanicus contains a letter from King Arthur to Henry II of England, claiming Arthur had been healed of his wounds and made immortal by his deathless, eternal nymph sister Morgan in the holy island of Avalon through the island's miraculous herb. In Eric and Enid by Chrétien de Troy, the consort of Morgan is the lord of the Isle of Avalon, Arthur's nephew named Gwingamar, also appearing in the same or similar role under similar names in other work. In Laemon's Brute, Arthur is taken to Avalon to be healed through means of magic water by a distinctively Anglo-Saxon version of Morgan. Dio Crone says the queen of Avalon is Enfidas, Arthur's aunt and goddess. The Venetian Les Prophetes de Merlin features the character of an enchantress known only as the Lady of Avalon or Damon d'Avalon, Merlin's pupil who is not Morgan and is in fact a rival and enemy of her. Potentially Nimue, but again this is speculation. Morgan also features as an immortal ruler of a fantastic Avalon, sometimes alongside the still alive Arthur and some subsequent and otherwise non-Authorian chivalric romances such as Tyrant Le Blanche as well as the tales of Juan of Bordeaux where the fairy King Oberon is a son of either Morgan by name or the Lady of the Secret Isle and the legend of Ogier the Dane where Avalon can be described as enchanted castle as it is in Florian et Florette. In his La Faula, Guillaume de Torrelia claims to have visited the enchanted isle, Illa Encantada, and met Arthur who has been brought back to life by Morgan and they both now are forever young, sustained by the Grail. In the chanson de Guest la Bataille la Coiffeur, Morgan and her sister Marcion, or Marion, bring the hero Renoir to Avalon where Arthur now prepares to return alongside Morgan, Gawain, Percival and Guinevere. Such stories typically take place centuries after the times of King Arthur. So yes, let's talk about the one true king narrative. Arthur is often seen as a representation of the righteousness and purity of the monarchy in general. He becomes king by demonstrating that he is indeed destined for greatness. The one true king of England is deposed by Mordred, a bastard son and pretender to the throne no less, and the legend ends with a promise that when England is at its lowest ebb, when the righteous leader is needed, the one true king will return to set things right once more, which means that as he has yet to do so, we can probably surmise that Arthur is fine with 
austerity, bigotry, ravaging of the nation by disease multiple times, and outright genocide of the vulnerable multiple times, because none of these things have been considered England's time of greatest need. So where does this idea come from? The possibility of Arthur's return is first mentioned by William of Malmesbury in 1125, but Arthur's grave is nowhere seen whence antiquity of fables still claims that he will return. Indeed, for hundreds of years after his death, various sources indicate that this belief in Arthur's eventual messianic return was extremely widespread amongst Britons from the 12th century onwards. How much earlier than this it existed in such a widespread form is still debated, though it's undeniable that it did because, well, that's how myth and legend work. It did, in fact, remain a powerful aspect of the Arthurian legend throughout the medieval period and beyond. John Lydgate, in his Fall of Princes, 1431-38, notes the belief that Arthur shall resort as lord and sovereign out of fair and reign in Britain, and Philip II of Spain apparently swore, at the time of his marriage to Mary I of England in 1554, that he would resign the kingdom if Arthur, the one true king of England, should return. The influence of Arthur's legend is not confined to fiction, however. The legend of Arthur's return has often been politically influential. On the one hand, and it seems to have provided a means of rallying Welsh resistance to Anglo-Norman incursions in the 12th century and later. The Anglo-Norman text Description of England recounts of the Welsh that openly they go about saying that in the end they will have it all, by means of Arthur they will have it back, they will call it Britain again. It may be that such references as this reflect a Welsh belief that Arthur ought to be associated with the Mabderogan or Son of Prophecy, a messianic figure of the Welsh prophetic tradition who would repel the enemies of the Welsh and who is often identified with heroes such as Cadwallader, Owain Laugot, and Owain Glyndwyr in Welsh prophetic verse. However, as Oliver Padell has noted, no example of a Welsh prophetic poetry telling of Arthur's return to expel the enemies of the Welsh from Britain has survived, which some have seen as troubling and a reason for caution. We must rely on non-Welsh texts for the notion that this was a widespread belief amongst the Welsh from the mid-12th century onwards, along with more debatable evidence such as Henry VII's attempt to associate himself with Arthur when taking the throne. Subsequent monarchs went on to claim ownership or legitimacy over or through Arthurian legend, some even claiming to either be Arthur himself, returning to save the kingdom from whatever group of people they didn't like, or else that Arthur had returned at some point but nobody noticed, and that they were his descendants. It's unclear how many people actually believe this, of course, but the symbology and tradition was really attractive to many people in the Middle Ages. And I mean, if you're going to claim that you are divinely chosen by God to rule, then why not that you're descended from a folkloric hero too? Arthur's remained an occasionally political potent figure through to the present era. For example, some claim that the Duke of Wellington, whose first name was Arthur, was a manifestation of King Arthur returning to defend Europe from Napoleon's invasion by defeating him at Waterloo, and in the 20th century, a comparison of John F. Kennedy and his White House with Arthur and Camelot, made by Kennedy's widow, helped consolidate Kennedy's posthumous reputation, with Kennedy even becoming associated with an Arthur-like messianic return in American folklore. This somehow has led to some weirdos at QAnon claiming that JFK, or potentially his son JFK Jr., who died in a plane crash in 1999, is actually going to return and make Donald Trump president again or something, because we simply can't have nice things, I guess. And now, of the death of Arthur I shall sing, and how to the island Avalon he sailed, the once and future. So, who was King Arthur? Well, we don't really know for sure, but it is my opinion that he was likely a local warlord or mercenary operating in Wales in the Dark Ages, and played a decisive role in stopping the Anglo-Saxon invasion of Britain in its tracks, at least for a time. However, there is no conclusive proof that he existed, or if the story of Arthur isn't actually just an amalgamation of several historical figures, a telling of legends of a folkloric god or hero, or any number of other possibilities. However, it's certainly true that much of what we know, or rather what people for hundreds of years believed and embellished upon was largely fabricated and taken directly from the imagination of good old Geoffrey of Monmouth, and as such is largely unreliable. The aesthetics of Arthurian legend are just about a thousand years ahead of the reality, but honestly, it's hardly surprising, and so long as we acknowledge the inaccuracy, I don't think it's a huge problem. It is, after all, rather less cinematic and dramatically satisfying to have Camelot be an ancient wooden hill fort, Excalibur be an ordinary sword that's less effective than your average kitchen knife, and all the characters be unwashed by 
barbarians cloaked in furs and caring very little for chivalry or honour. It's important though that we take notice of the clash of cultures within Arthurian legend. The Christian and the pagan influences can be seen within these stories, and the various characters and incidents within these stories are indicative of this. The Lady of the Lake gives Arthur his sword, but God sends him on a quest for the Holy Grail. Arthur observes Christian morality and chivalric values, and yet at the end of his life is taken across a magical lake to an otherworldly realm of fairies, from which it is speculated he will one day be supernaturally resurrected and return. King Arthur is a folk tale for all to enjoy, but if there's one thing I'd love for you to take away from this video, is this. These ancient legends have deep, complex, and fascinating histories, and the version we're told about as kids, and even as adults, is merely the modern interpretation. If you're interested in these kinds of legends, investigate them, look into their origins, and don't let their ancient influences be erased by what amounts to Dark Ages colonialism. If there's a local legend like this in your country, look into it. You might find there's so much more to dig into than you first thought, and who doesn't love a journey of discovery? As a result of mine, I'm going to go on a very weird, and probably to anyone else looking in, boring weekend away to visit historical Celtic sites in Glastonbury. Maybe you can have a similar experience. I hope so. I'm not a scholar, or any kind of expert of course, and if you've heard a different myth, or if you have a similar legend where you are, comment it below. I would love to hear them. <laughs> We're not Anglo-Saxons anymore. We might as well refer to Jutes. <laughs> Why do you call us Anglo-Saxons? We don't have anything in common with you in that sense. We're not Anglo-Saxons. Hello everyone, uh, thanks so much for watching this video. This is actually the second time I recorded it, and yes, I recorded the entire fucking video the first time, and there was something wrong with the audio, and I'm really hoping it doesn't happen this time, because if it does, I'm going to lose my fucking shit. Um, <laughs> but thanks so much for watching. I'm recording this while a little bit ill on a weekend, because um, I didn't have anything better to do this weekend. Um, and yeah, I hope you enjoyed this video. It was so much fun to research this. I like doing these sort of less overtly political, more kind of fun videos, so uh, I might do a couple more of them. But uh, yeah, this is the first video of 2022, so I, I guess we're starting off with a fun one, which is nice. Anyway, thanks so much for watching. Um, watching, of course, really helps me with the uh, the algorithm and, and things like that. Uh, if you do want to help me out a lot, um, I do have links in the description where well, there's actually one link to my um, link tree, uh, but I do have merch if you want to buy merch. I didn't push it over Christmas because I thought that would be a bit crass. Um, I don't know, maybe I should have done. <laughs> um, you can join my Patreon uh, if you like. I'll go into Patreon stuff in the moment. I can chuck me some money on uh, on coffee. Follow me on Twitter, and of course, you know, like, subscribe, hit the bell, all that shit. Um, so with regards to Patreon, uh, I'm currently looking into revamping it and offering some better benefits. Um, at the moment, if you subscribe to me on Patreon uh, at the $1 tier. Essentially, you'll get your name at the end of the credits like this. Uh, if you donate $2 or more, I'll read your name out at the end of the credits. And also, you, you get early access to videos and um, and you get like, video scripts when they're done. I'll upload a PDF of those. Uh, although, actually, you actually do get a slightly better, I guess, than, uh, than just video scripts because you get earlier drafts of video scripts because sometimes I fuck up because I'm not very good at my job and I actually have to do another version of the script after I upload it. Um, so I guess uh, behind the scenes stuff. Um, and I'm gonna start making Patreon only content for uh, for five dollar plus patrons. So uh, keep a look out for that. I guess. Um, if you do have any suggestions for uh, for stuff I should start doing for patrons as well, please do let me know. Uh, but yeah, I'm glad that you watched this video all the way through. Uh, congratulations, I guess. Um, so today I would especially like to thank Elise the Mighty She Beast, Aride, Chris Ragnacci. Next we have Ryan. Uh, Brian, it's Brian, Oogity Boogity, Stacey Solano, Bulk, Tom Newport, Caleb Shipley, Felix Sanguis, Clastrup, Nanza Kambe, Oft Wears Hats, Susie M, and of course, Les and his friend, Bob. Thanks again for watching everyone, and I hope you have a good one. I'll see you in the next one. Bye!